So good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us. There's always better things to do than listen to research methodology lectures on uh, any day uh, at, in the evening, uh, especially when it's great weather out here in Chennai, and probably there are people from Chennai and uh, many other places, and everyone might just prefer to do something else. But here is something that's actually quite important for everyone. There's a reason why I think all lawyers should be learning research methodology. And much of this lecture is actually about making a case for why we should start introducing research methodology as one of the courses right in the undergraduate study of law itself. Uh, it is already a mandatory course for anyone who does an LLM. It's a full semester course. Uh, but when it comes to UG studies, we don't touch it. We have something called as legal methods, which is nothing akin to what research methodology is. Uh, legal methods are all about how to, uh, it, it's more like an introductory course to law itself. And it's not really about how do you conduct research. And the reason why I'm trying to use this forum for advancing the cause of research methodology is twofold. One, I know that there are a lot of undergraduate students here. I also know that there are a lot of practicing lawyers here. And uh, practicing lawyers have a role to play in the way the curriculum for, for legal studies are being, for, are being developed and implemented in our country. So since there are also lawyers available over here, I want to push this case. And as, as this presentation will uh, demonstrate to you, this is some important piece of knowledge that all of us must possess. And there are many reasons for it. I'll be coming to that. So as an agenda for our day, uh, it's much of the lecture is a bit about why we need to learn the subject called RM, how it's useful for practitioners, how it should inform new directions for our academic research. And why definitely it's a must must for policy practitioners. Yeah, uh, we'll touch a few key concepts involved in research methodology. We have about one hour devoted to today's session. And uh, it's, it's anybody's guess and everyone would know that in one hour we can't cover a course that is usually taught over a period of a full semester. But what we can do is touch upon a few key concepts. Uh, so that anyone who wishes to learn this further has some kind of a background on where to start. So my lecture itself, my talk itself would be for about 30 to 40 minutes and the balance 20 minutes we can utilize for the purpose of questions and answers. Yeah. So let me really uh, start off with the first thing with a song story, right? You know, there was in 2007, uh, this major study that was done in India on child sexual abuse. This was commissioned by the Ministry of <clears throat> Women and Child Development. And this was a really shocking set of things that came out of this study. We found that two out of every three children in India were physically abused, uh, sexually abused, right? 53% of the survey children reported one or more forms of sexual abuse. Now, please don't get me mistaken here. By sexual abuse, I mean a very broad thing. It's not just penetrative sexual assault. Any kind of sexual abuse, whether it is verbal, whether it is touch-based or non-touch-based, right? 53% is more than half the number of children in our country. So that's a huge figure. But when you look at the number of cases of child sexual abuse that were coming into our knowledge, number of cases in the sense what were being registered as FIRs and being prosecuted, it was really, really small. When, when a lead study says nearly half the children face this problem and when you look at the numbers, they are running into a few hundreds, literally. There's a huge gap between what is going on and definitely, uh, you know, the number of cases being registered, etc. So one major problem that was identified was that there were really low level of reporting of such cases. It was understood that these cases were not being brought to the notice of the police. No, no FIRs were being registered and no prosecutions were being launched. So great. One problem we have identified. Now, what is the solution to it? Now, in our country, India, we have this tendency to find a legislative solution to everything, right? Moment a social problem or some kind of a problem is thrown at us, our immediate response is, let us make a law that covers it. So there is mob lynching, you have a fresh law. Uh, doctors are being attacked, you have a fresh law. But anything and everything our solution is, make a new law and make a penalty for it. Same way when it came to reporting of child sexual abuse also, we created a section called Section 19 for mandatory reporting. Uh, I don't think I need to talk about the POXO Act here. Uh, I'm pretty sure everyone has heard of it. 
So there is something called mandatory reporting in section 19 of the POPSO Act, which says that any person, including a child, who has an apprehension that an offence under this act is likely to be committed, or has any knowledge that it has actually been committed, has to report it to the police. So that's a legal mandate. And if you don't report it to the police, you can be imprisoned up to six months. Or if you are a person who is in charge of an institution, right? Let's say that you are a principal of a school, or you are the administrator or person in charge of any childcare institution. In such cases, again, it is a heightened punishment of one year. Right? So pretty strong law. Uh, just for not reporting, there is six months or one year of imprisonment. Classic solution that we always follow: make a make the problem a crime and then say that if you don't comply with a certain obligation, you will be imprisoned for it. So this was again the problem that we took on for the problem of low levels of reporting. But did it really solve the problem? Well, sort of in part, but no and yes. All right. For one thing, uh, you do see that the number of cases did go up because more cases were getting reported. But then it had a very interesting side effect. To start off, let's understand why there were such low number of cases of cases being reported. When you look at data about child sexual abuse, now I've put up a graph there. Uh, this is from a study on child sexual abuse cases that uh, was conducted in West Bengal. I was a part of that study. We looked at a large number of cases from around the state. We looked at about 1000 plus cases across 10 districts. That was a sample. And we went through uh, all the details of those cases. And this is what we find that majority of them are cases where the child already knows the abuser. As you can see, 92.4% of the cases, the person who committed the offense or is accused of the offense is someone whom the child already knew. And if you look at the breakup, about 7% lost family, 32% was someone who was in the same vicinity, either a neighbor or a resident in the same village. At times, it's employers. You find teacher and student cases or acquaintances. So predominantly, it was someone who was already known to the child or to the family of the child. Which then also meant that taking it to the police was a difficult thing. You take it to the police and if an investigation starts, everyone's got to, will get to know that such an incident happened. And we know how victims of sexual abuse are viewed in this country. Right? Immediately, there's a lot of social stigma around it. Uh, there is also a, a negative publicity, if I may be permitted to use that word. All of these things happen. So that is, in fact, the reason why people did not want to report it to the police, that they did not want the whole thing to be dragged across the street and it, it looked like washing of dirty linen in public. That was the real reason why people were really reluctant to report it to the police. And by passing a law that if you don't report, it's going to be a crime, well, so does it actually solve the problem? Not really. Even now, the number of cases that are getting reported are far less compared to that 53% figure that we earlier saw. Right. Secondly, with this, it also left a very interesting impact on access to healthcare for victims. So in many cases of sexual abuse of children, especially penetrative sexual abuse, children get pregnant or children get seriously injured and they are taken to hospitals or they are taken to a doctor for treatment. Now with Section 19, it became mandatory for the doctor or the hospital to report it to the police. Right. And they did start reporting it also. So when the doctor examines a child and has a suspicion that probably this child is a victim of sexual abuse, then it's mandatory to report it to the police and they did report it. And that's not something that the parents really wanted. Over a short period of time, it really, this word gets, got spread around in the community that if you take your child to the hospital or to a doctor uh, when there is sexual abuse, the doctor will report it to the police. So this also started dissuading people from taking victims to the hospital. So it actually left an important impact on access to healthcare for victims. That's a side effect that nobody thought of when we made this law. No, so the bottom line is that there was a big social problem on why reporting was not happening. And we tried to solve it by using criminal law. Say that if you don't report, you will be punished. 
once we did it a it did not really improve the number of reporting at a, such a high level that did not happen plus it also actually had the side effect of dissuading people from uh, going to access medical facilities what really should have been done you know we should have tried to first understand the reason for lack of reporting figure out have a 360 degree view of the real problem and then try and arrive at a solution which will address the root causes of the problem secondly once the law is enacted you need to keep evaluating how it actually works on ground and all of this process must be driven by the idea of evidence it should be based on data hmm. it should not just be some logical arguments or our own intuitions about how things work that are driving it it should really be driven by a process of evidence based research and the studies that i pointed out both of them we can be a little bit proud that it was driven by lawyers so this this uh, graphs here the west bengal poxo study that i had referred to this was done by not just by a set of lawyers but lawyers were definitely leading it i was a part of the study the study which found that there was an impact on access to health care for victims was again conducted first conducted by an organization named majlis in bombay which was also an organization that tries to provide legal aid for victims right so all of these are works that really came from lawyers work now you know based on this knowledge we are right now conducting a lot of advocacy on why the provisions for mandatory reporting probably needs a change secondly this evidence that has come out of how the law really works on ground it can have a lot of practical application in litigation uh, just to give you an example if you recollect the nas foundation case uh, which challenged 377 one of the prongs of argument was that 377 as it stands prevented a lot of people who were lgbtq plus from accessing health care because if they went into any kind of healthcare systems and somebody got to know about it and then 377 is charged upon them that was a problem so especially when it came to uh, prevention of aids advocacy they were really being left out i'm not saying only ground but one of the pillars on which the provision was struck down was this that the provision as it stood was impeding the right of access to healthcare and now here in a similar vein we are coming out with evidence out of the study that the provision as it stand is creating barriers to accessing healthcare and this is not just someone's wild guess this is actual evidence based on large number of interviews that we have done across a large number of places multi multiple set of places so that's again you know these kind of research is also giving us evidence at times which will help the framing of pils or conducting of litigations Uh, I see that there is a raised hand, but I would I would request you to hold your questions for the time being. Uh, I'll complete my lecture thirty to forty minutes, and then I'm, then we'll go to questions. Yeah. So just jot down your questions somewhere for the moment. Yeah. Yeah. So these kind of studies also help even a process of litigation, especially when it comes to establishing social facts before courts of law. Uh, so PILs and not even PILs, even regular litigations, wherever we need social facts to be established. this is a standard way of coming out with these social facts right and we should also view this in the larger picture of you know the changing nature of legal work what lawyers traditionally did was either litigation or transactional lawyering or legal advice which is with companies or individuals and most of academic lawyering really involved only on commenting on cases or commenting on legislation from the standpoint of black letter of law at times from the standpoint of uh, political theory or political philosophy what we call jurisprudence essentially it was more of normative analysis of some form of conceptual analysis that we did but what do we do now there's this much more going on lawyers are found working on policy lawyers are actively involved in the development sector and the social sector and academic lawyering itself has moved on or not just limited itself to normative analysis but we also want to understand how does law work in a given setting uh, what is happening on ground how is it actually efficient is this law in question really giving us the uh, promised good uh, is it then that that knowledge that we built is is used then for advocating changes 
find different kind of solutions for problems and you know it's really based on what we call evidence based analysis or empirical analysis so there's this this beautiful transition that we keep making from dealing with law just based on legal or you know, philosophical principles alone uh and going more forward to understanding law as an institution that really works in a complex setting uh in in a certain social reality and that's where research methodology comes in <laughs> you know there's this story that uh, one of my mentors in in research once told me that and he was not a lawyer he was a social scientist he once told me that the problem with us lawyers is that uh, we have a screwdriver in our hands that is the law and we are going around hunting for screws to tighten right every time a social problem is thrown at us we want to come out with a new legislation or a new law to fill up that gap because we are really hunting for that many of these are problems where passing of a law will not be sufficient we need to really understand what is happening on ground we need to understand what is human nature what what drives human behavior uh, what drives societal behavior and then try and come out with solutions because for everything making a law is not a solution at times maybe the law as we have made it is the problem or a part of the problem itself to to really gauge these problems to understand and make sense of these things we need to really understand social science literature and the biggest problem that most people face and i faced when i started working with other social scientists is what is the language that they are speaking it was a completely new language they say the words like variables hypothesis regression all these are new set of words that were completely new and alien to me and it took a while to really understand what these mean so that you can you know you need to really pick up this language of research right so just to make sense of what people from other disciplines are saying we need to start understanding their language and the way to start doing it is really start learning research methodology and once you get that it really opens up a whole new field of of inquiry for you as opposed to the earlier idea that lawyers would only do more of legal theory research or a little bit of expository research which which is you look at you know conventions treaties some philosophy to understand what is the black letter of the law or we look at more conceptual foundations of the law which comes from legal philosophy or jurisprudence a little bit of it was also we also had some fundamental research but it really opens up much more of possibilities for us once we understand what are empirical methods how do social scientists really construct knowledge how do social scientists go about creating knowledge and once we understand those processes we can also be a part of it and play a role in law reform research or more fundamental research yeah uh so let, let's like like i told you this really no way that i can give you a meaningful uh, exposition of research methodology in one hour that's a long <clears throat> it's really a matter of we teach it typically over a semester and uh, what i've also realized that is that in, even in one semester we can only give some fundamental concepts put some fundamental concepts in place and um really learning research methodology is a self taught thing we can only teach you what to learn and guide you in the process but over a period of time by doing it you get the hang of it so with that that caveat that i am i won't really be able to cover a lot let me try and uh, put across a couple of basic ideas here uh first thing to remember is that research is a very systematic affair with a broad protocol to be followed this is not journalism so a journalist let, let's just go back to that problem of of mandatory reporting that i was talking about for a journalist it is okay to go land up in that place talk to one victim or two victim talk to one doctor get a couple of quotes and then build a story out of it that is what he is expected to do and it's it's legit that he does it like that right on the other hand uh research is not like that it is has to be systematic it has to be controlled you need to be empirical because uh one off incidents are not enough for us to make general uh you know arrive at any generalization all right uh it has to be really guided by a theoretical framework uh probably if, if especially if it's a quantitative study we need some kind of a hypothesis in place 
and we our our uh, product end product of research should ideally contribute towards generation of theory right so it's it's, it's much more of a protocol driven thing and it's just not like journalism and what are the common set of errors that we end up making as researchers or uh, not really end up making as researchers but common set of errors that drive our thinking process it seems so things to keep in mind before we start getting into research first thing is what we call individual fallacy which is to make conclusions about individuals uh, only based on analysis of a group data let me try and illustrate what i mean by this uh, let's say that we are trying to understand uh, math skills of people all right so let's say that we pick up data about what are the average math scores that uh, different classes have across a district let's say that we find there are 100 schools in a district we have asked we have obtained data about what is the score average math score that each of these schools have in say class 10th and we find that there is a particular school where the average is 92% and i glanced up in that school and i find the student from that class and i conclude that he must be a math genius uh, that's wrong because you can't really uh, that extrapolate the data like that based on analysis of group data into an individual it could be wrong for the simple reason that you are talking about averages here so let's say that there were 100 people in that class let's also imagine that 90 people in that class were really good at maths they have all scored above 100% and this guy is actually someone who keeps failing every time but the average of the class will still remain high right and then if you conclude on that average if you conclude that because he is a member of that group he must be a genius that is what you call an individual fallacy similarly there is something called as an exception fallacy which is quite the opposite of it which is we make big conclusions about groups by using data collected at uh, at a small individual level uh, exception fallacy is also often the basis of things like racism right we've all heard of the statement about how women are very poor drivers we may have seen one or two women who drive very poorly and then based on that one data point or two data points we reach this large scale conclusion that all women must be driving very poorly right these two are very common errors that common people end up committing and as researchers we have to watch out for it and that's why we need to have protocols we need to have a system in place for the purpose of uh, a scientific method for the purpose of conducting our research uh, we have to have a method by which we collect data a framework within which we analyze the data and there are certain principles which guide how we make inferences from the data so this is not a matter of common sense right in fact often common sense will uh, is doesn't sit or augment too well with the idea of research methodology um, it has to be based on facts uh, it has to be guided by theory and trying to use your personal life experiences or trying to perpetuate common myths or media myths is not what any kind of systematic social science researches which means that things like your intuition uh, your tenacity these ideas of common sense your personal experience or that someone important said it uh, or at times even just using your logic all of these are not really good sources of knowledge for the purpose of social science research social science research has to be uh, guided by a system for you know you have to systematically collect data there has to be an objective and there has to be objectivity in your work and it is also uh, guided towards a certain objective uh, it's consists of two parts there is theory and observation and remember social science is called a bit of soft sciences because the subject matter that human beings are a bit fluid and hard to measure with great precision but very important for us is that it is an empirical exercise enterprise we we assume that facts exist prior to the theories that explain them so what does this process really involve a snapshot of it is really cap captured in this diagram uh, the first step is to always define a research problem all right a uh, research problem is a knowledge gap it's not a social problem it is not a practical problem that we are facing it is a knowledge gap it is a knowledge problem just to illustrate what i mean let's take the case of this mandatory reporting or let, let me pick another example let's we all know that police is very bad at registering frauds 
uh, forget child sexual abuse for any kind of cases to go to the police station and get your FIR registered is not an easy task. That's something that all of you would know if you've tried doing it at least once in your lifetime. Right. Now, this is a problem. Right. It is a social problem. It is definitely a legal problem, an institutional problem that we have that the police is not doing their job. But that is not a research problem. A research problem is when we try to understand why they are not doing it. All right. What is the reason that they are refusing to do it? That is a knowledge gap for us. That is a research problem. All right. So whenever a researcher uses the word problem, understand that he's talking about a knowledge problem or a knowledge gap and not a social problem or a practical problem. Once we have defined our research problem carefully, let's actually look at, look at this thing of, let, let, let's just pick the example of why polis is refusing to register their FARs. Uh, the next step is really to do what we call a literature review. Has somebody else already tried to do this, has done any research on this? That's the first question to look at. We need to see what is the existing amount of research and writing on this knowledge problem. So we look at published materials. We at times look at non-published materials too. But essentially what we do is sit down and really do a desk review of what is the existing amount of work on this issue. Now, once we find that there is sufficient amount of research that has been done on it, then there's not really a need to go to the next set of steps. Uh, if we find that the existing amount of literature is really covers everything in place, then probably there's no reason for us to go into the next set of things and our whole enterprise ends here. But where we find that, let's say it's a case that nobody has written on it before, or you find that after you review all the existing literature, you find that, well, there is a gap, probably there's something more to it. Uh, either you know it out of your own experience or you know it out of a certain intuitive sense, or you find that there are gaps in the existing literature, that's when we go to the next steps, which is typically to start formulating a hypothesis, right? So let's say that most of the existing set of literature says that it is because of corruption. All right, or let us say that a lot of literature says that it is because the police doesn't want to do their job. But let's say that you have a fresh hypothesis to it, that it's not really about any of these things, but there's something more that is what your hypothesis is. Now, let me make one thing very clear. In social science research, a hypothesis is not always mandatory unless you are doing a quantitative study. When it comes to qualitative studies, it's not really mandatory that you need to have a hypothesis. What is more mandatory is to have what we call research questions. Research questions are what are the exact set of knowledge questions that we are going to answer for the purpose of conducting this research, right? Next step, once we have a hypothesis or research question, is to figure out the appropriate research design. That's a term that I'll come to next. Uh, after you have your research design, you need to collect your data, which is the physical act of going out there and collecting data, either which is data which is secondary or primary. Primary data is the data that you collect yourself. Secondary data is data that has been collected by somebody else and is made available to you, right? Uh, so you may collect data, either primary data or secondary data, and then you analyze the data properly. And then, of course, you interpret and report. Once you do that, it is actually going into this body of knowledge that is being created. Right. So that's why you see that there are certain feedback, feed forward and feedback loops here. This whole process is something that keeps going in a cyclic process. Uh, research design is essentially clarifying what the research problem is. Uh, do your review of literature and planning the research, which is what is the methodology that you're going to use? What kind of data that you are, are you going to use or produce? And of course, also having been very grounded in how feasible is your research approach? And yes, there are ethical considerations that are involved. I mean, things like protecting uh, the identity of your, of the people who you give you data, ensuring that people who are the subject matter of your research do not uh, meet any harm later on. These are the broad research ethical considerations that are involved. Uh, research design is essentially that framework for collection and analysis of data. And it's, it's, it's a choice that we have to make as researchers based on what is the best method for answering the problem before us. All right. Uh, 
the most common ones are either experiments a uh, lot of social so experiments are typically a product of uh, uh, or typically resorted to by natural scientists but it's used in social sciences too uh, psychologists use a lot of experimental research uh, i'd ask you to read upon something called as the stanford prison experiment that should give you some idea about what is this thing called as experimental research right uh, it is also used by legal researchers i give you examples of that as we keep going forward then there are surveys where you know you collect data at a large scale by uh, interviewing people then there's something called as case studies where you pick up one or two or three instances around the problem that we're trying to study and then go for it at depth at real depth we study it uh, from different dimensions then there are focus group discussions where we bring people together around the table and then get them to discuss in detail or expose or expose it around what exactly is the problem when i say problem i mean research problem right and then there are ethnographic models where uh, the researcher really spends a lot of time immersing himself in the context where uh, the problem arises and tries to find answers to it so when it comes to collecting data uh, there are two main approaches one is what we call the quantitative approach which is to try and ca think capture things in number and then there is uh, something called as qualitative where we are trying to more give give more detailed uh, descriptions of what things are let me try and explain this by a simple example uh, trying to compare cricketers let's let's pick up rahul dravid and sachin tendulkar who is a better player of cricket one way to answer it is by looking at statistics what is the average scores that they have what is their strike rates what has been their match winning performances you can look at all of this in terms of numbers or you could also look at this in terms of a qualitative study i mean who has a more perfect or, or a more beautiful shot to play whose cover drive beats the other one right so this is two ways of approaching the same thing uh, one is to try and look at numbers and the other one is to try and look at more of descriptions uh, they they really <clears throat> give two different set of outcomes right quantitative is of course tend to be much more of objective uh, because qualitative studies invariably is accused of having a certain amount of subjectivity of the researcher that creeps in uh, that's always the reason why we say that when you try to describe who has a more beautiful cover drive to play it's a matter of subjective opinion as opposed to what the statistics says right at the same time qualitative is valuable because uh, the number can never capture who has a beautiful more beautiful game to play like right. uh, similarly so quantitative is typically when we already know uh, what is the hypothesis that we are trying to test all right so when it comes to good evidence of causative relationships that's when quantitative studies come into the picture uh, at the population level when we want to try to describe the characteristics that is when quantitative studies come into the picture let me again try and explain this using the example of mandatory reporting uh, initially when when nobody knew what was going on in, in about this this problem of people not going to the doctors initially this research was a qualitative one so we we really did case studies around a small number of people about four to five victims we had deep conversations with the victims with the parents with the doctors with the police and from that we understood that uh, people are not going to doctors for the simple reason that they don't want this thing to be out there in public so that was a qualitative study and if you want to really take this to the population scale to really assert that this is a large scale problem that is happening at the level of all india that's when probably we have to do more of quantitative studies look across the country and try and build more data quantitative data to really show that a large percentage of victims do not go to the doctor because they don't want this information or this uh, thing to be taken to the police so that's 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 the quantitative dimension to it but quantitative studies are possible only when we know what are the variables are that that we are trying to uh, pick up or that we are trying to study when we have no idea about what is really going on we have to start with the qualitative process of talking to people understand what is going on and then build that rich text right so qualitative is really you know it's it's, it's more flexible we try to explore phenomena and we use a lot of semi structured methods such as interviews focus group discussion a lot of participant observations quantitative on the other hand is 
resorted to when you have a strong hypothesis and you want to confirm the hypothesis or test a hypothesis at a population level. Much more rigid, you have more of zero one kind of answers involved in there. And these are very highly structured methods. Just to give you two examples of this, which you can uh, go and read later on if you find, if you're interested. Uh, the first one is a beautiful qualitative study on, uh, so this investigator, this is an ethnographic study, spends a considerable amount of time in certain villages in Rajasthan where these parallel systems of justice exist, right? There are community-based structures of uh, justice and the researcher has written the paper about what is the role of power and what is the role of gender in the way these parallel systems of justice actually function. So there's a lot of rich detail in it. There are a lot of stories. There's a lot of incidences which are narrated there. And the process of theorization is something that comes out of these narrations. So it is so narrative driven. Another great study, a quantitative study that I would want all of you to look at, probably of great relevance in our contemporary time is this paper, which looks at data to investigate whether judges sort of get uh, motivated or get swayed by the possibility of a post-retirement job. Uh, so what the researchers did is they looked at all the case, decided cases from 1999 to 2014 and then try to see whether as a judge is approaching retirement time, is he less and less willing to rule against the government? And I'm not going to tell you what is the result of the study. Probably you should take a look at it yourself. It's a very rigorous study that does uses a lot of uh, statistical modeling. It does regressions for the purpose of examining a hypothesis. So they, they really started off, the quantitative study really started off with a hypothesis that yes, there is some connection and then develops a model for testing it. This one, on the other hand, doesn't start off with a hypothesis. It's much more open-ended. Uh, it has research questions like what is the role of gender and what is the role of power relations and caste relations in the operation of community justice systems. But it doesn't really start off with a solid hypothesis that yes, there is some relation or no, there isn't some relation. The purpose is to really explore what the relation is. That is where these qualitative studies happen. This one is, of course, much more structured. I'd, I'd really recommend that all of you take a look at both of these studies. Then there's a third thing called as participatory methods, which is trying, which tries to incorporate, you know, you'd really try to build data uh, or it, it, it tries to pick up knowledge that the communities already has about a certain uh, context. This, it's difficult to practice it at large scale. This is something that we resort to when we, when we, you know, when your subject matter is something as small as a village or a relatively smaller population, right? This is again, primarily qualitative in character, uh, where through a certain group dynamic of interactions with the aid of people who live in a certain place, we try to build a sufficient picture about how that community functions. Now, you know, this quantitative versus qualitative debate is, is a huge debate. Uh, generally people say, or tend to, uh, subscribe or, or give more credence to quantitative studies for the simple reason that it's thought to be much more neutral and objective compared to qualitative where there is the possibility of the researchers biases that has come in. Uh, it is also a product of disciplinary standings. Um, economics, for instance, are much more driven by quantitative data compared to say anthropologists who practically do most of their work on qualitative data. So these are also a matter of disciplinary stand, standpoints. Uh, my personal uh, view on this is that it's, it's not really a case of one is better than the other. Both of them play a very important role in social science research because they end up telling us two very different things. Uh, secondly, it's also important to remember that you can do quantitative studies only when we have some sort of an idea about at least a hypothesis in place uh, and to develop a hypothesis in a quantitative setting, you need to know what the variables are, what are in fact the factors that we think which affects the phenomena, right? And only if that much of knowledge is there, we will be able to design a quantitative study. But where we really have no idea what is going on, we just know that there is a phenomena, but we don't know what is driving it, what is influencing it, then we have no option but to really go in for qualitative, uh, qualitative studies. Uh, secondly, it's also that it's also important to remember that uh, 
qualitative studies will give you much more rich details on how a certain variable matters to a certain outcome but quantitative studies are better at telling us how much does it matter yeah uh, key attributes of a good research design first one is internal validity that's ensuring that uh, what we are saying is the cause effect relationship is in fact uh, what is causing that cause effect relationship right so we have to ensure that we have identified the variables correctly and that there is a covariation of cause and effect and of course that the cause actually precedes the effect and that we don't have any plausible alternations uh, external validity or generalizability is something very important it's understanding what is the scale to which you can generalize the findings from our study to the population level so coming back to that uh, study about uh, mandatory reporting we went and interviewed five people in bombay to conclude that people are getting dissuaded from approaching doctors now with the interview of these five people can we really conclude that all india this is what the phenomenon is can five interviews really be the ground to make such a conclusion no it can't be we need much more population level sampling for it for that purpose and this is sort of what we call as a cone of validity where uh, on 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 the x axis we have internal validity on the y axis we have external validity single case studies have as you can see uh, you know the whole point that of this graph is, is to say that uh, things like experiments will have a very high degree of external and internal validity we can extrapolate it to the population scale much easier uh, but things like uh, cross sectional field surveys have very high degree of generalizability but when it comes to the degree to which it, it can explain cause effect relationships it's much lesser and in a sense i'm figuring out what this graph means is all about what understanding external validity is i'm not going to go into it much detail right now because uh, that's that itself is a long lecture right selecting the appropriate research design is really all about uh, figuring out what is the most appropriate method for studying the problem at hand that being said we are all driven by our own comfort zones right we all tend to pick the design that we are more comfortable with i for instance i am much more happy to do qualitative studies so probably i end up doing more of that because i am comfortable though that's technically or ideally that's not the case it should really depend on the nature of the research phenomenon being uh, that we are trying to study so appropriate design has to be picked up by looking at how clear is our research problem and what is the existing state of research do we have enough amount of qualitative studies to tell us what the potential set of variables are which influences this phenomenon so that we can try and uh, test it using quantitative methods or is it a case where there is very little literature very little understanding or theorization or attempted theorization of what is going on so do we have to really start doing qualitative methods and a lot is about choosing the right sampling strategy sampling is something that uh, again we take about 2 to 3 hours to teach even in a classroom setting uh, the basic thing here is to ensure that your the sample that you are selecting will represent the population that we are studying uh, there are two kinds there are probability samples where the researcher has no control over who actually makes it to the sample who is the respondent who makes it to the sample uh, then there are non probability samples where the researcher makes a conscious choice about a certain set of people who will make it to the sample uh, at times non probability methods have to be resorted to because that's the only way to do the study to give you an illustration let's say that i am trying to study uh, i am trying to conduct a research on how uh, criminal gangs end up using children for the purpose of perpetuating crimes there's no way that i can do a probability sample there right i mean i don't have a data set of who are which are all the criminal gangs in this country and then select a you know sample by from that uh, in a way that it's a probability sample i will really have to try and pick up uh, one or two criminal gangs or even one that i have access to and then conduct case studies and have deep conversations with them that's pretty much the only way that i can do that study right so that's just this giving you the snapshot of the idea that there's something called as sampling methods and choosing the right sampling method is the key to really achieving the right amount of external validity 
So what should really an RM course teach you? It should teach you what are the approaches to theorization? What are the processes by which we build theory? How do we collect and analyze data? And of course, how do you finally publish your research? That is what an RM course is all about. And what I gave you in the last 20 to 30 minutes is just a snapshot of what these things must be. Yeah. So now I can take questions. I can see that they're probably there in the chat box. One second. Uh, yeah, Professor, they are on the Q&A box. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Q&A box, right. Social stigma, taboo, and instinct are the hurdles for implementation of Nexus 19 of the POXO Act. Uh, yes, that is true. It's very true. It is social stigma, taboo, and all of those things that's preventing people from reporting it. But that, that's the parent point, right? That what is the point in making a law when we know that these are the factors which, which really inhibits reporting? Then are we really solving anything by declaring that this is a crime? Does it actually solve any of the problems? Many of us confuse empirical research with qualitative research. Uh, similarly, qualitative research is understood to be synonymous with doctoral research. The above, of course, is not true. Could you please share your own suggestions methodology to avoid this confusion? Sure. Uh, the confusion really is a product of, well, well you know, for one thing, uh, like I was saying, we don't learn anything called as research methodology in, in our undergraduate studies. Unlike the social scientists, which is rooted in some kind of methodological tradition, law is not. Uh, this is also because law is a normative discipline in the sense that we are concerned about how human beings are supposed to behave. There's something that is laid down as this is the appropriate behavior. We have some philosophy, etc., which, which tries to draw limits on what law should be doing or should not be doing. But it's not like the social sciences which try to explain what human behavior actually is. And our own approach in legal education that, you know, you learn one page of one paper of sociology or two papers of sociology, another one, little bit of political science, a little bit of uh, economics. It doesn't really teach you. It doesn't give you any kind of insight into the way these disciplinarians think. We just pick up a little bit of information from here and there. And that's just being uh, put into us. Probably the fault lies in the way legal education is being structured itself that we think that little bit of everything will, will, be, will be a sufficient substitute for deep learning of at least one discipline. So uh, suggestion is, is that one, please start having research methodology as a serious course in undergraduate studies. Secondly, probably have a relook that do we really, uh, you know, get people to learn a little bit of everything of these social sciences or try and learn at least one social science at some depth. That's, that's a bigger question that we'll have to think about. Uh, or if Muzaffar asks, is there a book on legal research methodology that you would like to suggest? Oh, there are several. In fact, this is, this is a tough thing for me to answer. There are many books uh, on research methodology. Uh, it really depends on which one uh, would you like to follow. Is it, is it really, uh, would you prefer to do uh, quantitative studies or qualitative studies? But for starters, as in just to uh, try and have some kind of idea about uh, what, what it can mean for legal researchers. Uh, some of the books that I would study is, you could actually start looking at the Oxford Handbook of Empirical Legal Research for starters, which kind of surveys what are the different, uh, uh, at least what is the existing state of literature on some of the key empirical legal issues that's, that's that being followed. Another great book that I would really like to recommend is this book called uh, Empirical Legal Research, a guidebook for lawyers, legislators, and regulators. This is a very nice book, which has been uh, written by Franz S. Liu and Hans Kiemitz. So this was published, if I remember it rightly, by Elgar. Uh, the title of the book is Empirical Legal Research, a guidance book for lawyers, legislators, and regulators. That's another fabulous book that I would uh, recommend. I think these are uh, good, good books to start with or that is a great book to start with. Uh, the other things are you can you can really look at the uh, standard research methodology textbooks that Oxford has published. Almost all of them are uh, really good, easy and simple to read. I would suggest that. Uh, and uh, yeah, that, that, that's pretty much what my suggestion is. Yeah, then Legal research is mostly qualitative method, which is the most appropriate research design. Uh, sorry, I don't agree with it. Uh, legal research, as we call it, 
let's let's clarify what what that really means. Uh, if you are talking about normative research in law or uh, theoretical, I mean, in the jurisprudence sense of research in law, there's nothing qualitative about it because it is not empirical. Uh, what what is a qualitative and quantitative is necessarily only when it is an empirical research and. Uh, legal research can as much be uh, empiric, I mean, qualitative or quantitative, like like Shubhangar Dham's paper that I had cited there. It's only a quantitative analysis, and that's that's as much as good as good legal social science research as any other qualitative studies are. Yeah. Uh, sir, I want to ask why in Poxo case minor male. Also, I don't think this is the forum for us to really discuss that. We can have a separate session on the POXO Act if, if that's needed. Let's just stick to research methodology questions as of now. Uh, Mudit Goal asks, how, how can research overcome common errors like individual policy and exception policy? Well, the whole point is to have a proper, strong design in place uh, to identify the right kind of research design for the purpose of conducting your study and to have a proper protocol in place for the purpose of collecting data and to have a serious framework, a scientific one for the purpose of analyzing data. So essentially research methodology is all about how to avoid these fallacies. Yeah. What were your suggestions in mandatory reporting under the POXO Act out of your research study? Uh, well, I, I really say that this is work in progress at many levels. Uh, one, because to some extent, mandatory reporting is, is needed, it is required, uh, at least with the idea that uh, at least, you know, uh, the levels of reporting are so slow. And then there are a lot of people who might want to report, but considering that they are not having enough social power in their hands, they are not able to really access and uh, bring it to the notice of the police. But if it goes from, say, a doctor, etc., it would be in a much better uh, position. So my, my suggestions really around it is to, it should go around the autonomy of the person. If a person wishes to report, only then you should be uh, uh, reporting it. Otherwise, it should not be reported. It should be left to an individual to decide whether he wants to report it or not. Uh, my suggestion is really enabling people to report, to give them the confidence. So that's not really one thing. It's really a complex set of things which covers witness protection, which is also uh, helping the victims to deal with social stigma, uh, which itself is a complex thing. It will require counseling. In some cases, it might require assistance for moving out. It will also require protection of witnesses. So it's, it's not just one thing. It's, it's really a lot of things that are required to address the problem of lack of reporting. Uh, the bottom line is just to say that just to have a penalty for not reporting is definitely not going to solve the problem. Yeah. So for a PhD candidate between qualitative and quantitative data analysis, which one would fetch good impact upon you? Well, that depends on what is your research problem and what is the state of existing literature about it. If uh, this is something that is susceptible to quantitative studies and if you have the skills and knowledge to do it, well, great, because generally quantitative studies uh, have much more of reception and, and it's uh, definitely uh, given more credence, if I want to use that word. So if, if it's something where quantitative study is possible, then it, it makes sense to do it. Yeah. According to, uh, to Young, the research design is always based on hypothesis. How can uh, we relate to legal research which is emerging at present? Well, you know, uh, like I said, that a hypothesis is not a mandatory thing for all kinds of researches. A hypothesis is mandatory if you are doing quantitative studies. Uh, because uh, quantitative studies is all about hypothesis testing using numbers. That's, that's the whole research design comes out of that. When you are doing qualitative studies, it's not mandatory to have a hypothesis. It's only mandatory to have appropriate research questions. And then, of course, the research design stems out of your research questions. Yeah. So which are the fields we can start researching upon as beginners? Uh, can we do any research on animal rights? You can do research on anything under the planet. Uh, what I would ask you to do as beginner is to try and do research on things that you are best skilled in and where your knowledge is the best. Remember that the research is a process for producing fresh knowledge. Yeah. And you don't really get to produce fresh knowledge unless you are yourself very sound with existing knowledge. Uh, 
Isaac Newton said that if I have seen a little further, it is because I've stood on the shoulders of giants. So before getting into any kind of research, it's first thing is to develop some solid knowledge base around one thing and then start your research around it. Um, of course, animal rights also, there's plenty of scope for research, I suppose. Though I can't really give you a suggestion for a topic because it's not my area of expertise at all. So I really have nothing to suggest on. This is what you should do your research on. Yeah. Many of us are told by our teachers that a researcher should be neutral. Is it right for a researcher to be neutral? Yes, there is a huge debate about this. Uh, well, personally, I don't think that we need to be neutral. Uh, I think we need to be objective and objective and neutrality are not the same thing. Objectivity means that uh, you have to be honest in the way you collect your data. You have to be true to a rigorous framework when you're interpreting your data. You should not concoct results and you should be prepared to accept that, uh, you know, things are not what you thought it is. Like I've said, that social research is often lands you open a lot of surprising situations. So I think the idea of objectivity is, is that uh, don't go out of the way to try and confirm your hypothesis or don't try and cherry pick data that just supports your worldview. Uh, objectivity there means that uh, your mentality to admit that what you thought was the way a certain thing happened, that your hypothesis could in fact be incorrect. Uh, Right. So that's why we say that we test hypothesis, not prove it. We test whether it is correct or not. That is what objectivity means. I don't think you need to be neutral because neutral is a word that I'm a little uncomfortable with. Uh, I think we all should take positions, but we need to be honest about it. That's what I mean. Yeah. Uh, next question is academic centers and think tanks do not perhaps interface enough. Academics may be excellent guides for earlier career researchers outside academia. Uh, is this desirable and if yes, how to incentivize such a culture? Of course, uh, not take academics efforts for granted. I'm not entirely sure what that question meant. Uh, probably, well, well I, I do understand that there is a need for a good interface between academics and think tanks. Uh, well, a part of the problem is also that a lot of think tanks are just driven by who funds them. Uh, probably academics, which... Uh, are not really driven by an external funding, maybe in a better position to come out with more objective kind of research, if I may be permitted to use that word. So yes, and, and yes, most of uh, policy advocacy, even in the legal realm is now being done by think tanks. Uh, sadly, academic institutions are lagging behind a little, at, at least legal ones are. So th that I suppose is, is somewhere that, that we are lagging behind and we need to catch up. Yeah. Uh, when is literature review used in research, whether in quantitative or qualitative? Any kind of research. Any kind of research first involves a literature review. It, it starts off with a literature review. You can't skip that step. Yeah. Uh, can you differentiate uh, the with hypothesis and research question with facts or example? Well, hypothesis is a case where I'm already predicting that there is a certain relationship between variables. Uh, right. Uh, for instance, I start saying that the decision to lodge an FIR is guided by uh, the fact that the abuser is not a relative. Let's say that that is a hypothesis. All right. I can go ahead, collect data and test the hypothesis. Uh, a research question is to ask what are the factors that guide the decision of a person to go and lodge an FIR? So that's more open-ended because I don't have a predetermined suggestion on that it is factor A or factor B or factor C. I am asking the question, what is the factor that determines? And then I go ahead and collect data, right? Hypothesis is where I've already made a predictive statement that the factor that determines the decision to lodge an FIR is whether the abuser is a relative or not a relative. So there I've already made a directional statement that this is probably the factor. And then I'm going ahead and testing it. I hope I've, uh, that made sense to you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Professor, I think we are out of our scheduled time. And uh, okay. thank you for yeah. interesting and very informative talk, Professor. Thank you. Thank you. Our thanks to everyone uh, who took time to attend this session. Uh, for all the students who are attending this session, our final round of application is in progress. And we have only 10 days left for the final applications deadline. Uh, if you want to apply, you can go to our website, www.dakshafellowship.org and apply. 
we look forward to having your applications for the daksha fellowship if you have any additional questions or uh, if you have any queries do reach out to us through the contact us from from our website or you can also reach out to us through our phone uh, 9940057400 uh, thank you very much for the session